Welcome back. The next talk we're going to have is about uh, simulating fusion plasmas. Um, and I'm going to hand across to Thomas to tell us about this. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, so now for something completely different, uh, as they say. This is not a talk about EasyBuild. This is not even a talk about SPAC. This is a talk about, well, I'm a physicist. My name is Thomas A. Schneider. I work at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, just outside Munich in Germany. Um, and, and I was asked if I, I would like to give a talk today about a little bit about fusion plasmas and, and, and a little bit about, about how we go about uh, simulating and modeling fusion plasmas. Um, so that's basically the, the, the gist of the talk. Um, the outline I want to, or what I want to talk about is what, is what is fusion? How does it work? Why is it awesome? Why is it hard? A little bit about tokamaks and ETA, which is sort of what we're doing, how we model them, and, and maybe a few words about the outlook and the future and, and, and why the future is, is interesting. So what is fusion? Nuclear fusion is a process in which two or more nuclei are combined to form something, blah, 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 blah. That's the quote from, from, from uh, Wikipedia. Um, it is a, a process which can release energy. Uh, and it's in principle, it's an ideal and it would be a clean source of electricity if we can get it to work. It's the fundamental process that goes on in the sun, and it's somehow the, the opposite of, of, of nuclear fission or normal nuclear power, which I'm sure um, people will know. Um, and the big difference is fission releases power by splitting big atoms, and fusion releases power by joining small ones. So we see this figure here. Essentially, this is these are all the different atoms or nuclei in, 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 in the universe. Uranium wants to split in half, and so everything in, in wants to, to end up in the middle. So iron or nickel is, is what every atom wants to be. Uranium can, can go up that this way, but we're really looking at this end down here. We want to take two, two things down here, join them together, and because we go uphill, we, we release energy. So that's the plan. Um, so that's the, the, the gist, but I mean, we, we want to get specifics. How are we actually going to do it? What can we choose? So two small uh, uh, elements that we can, or two, two small a nuclei that we can join together, release energy, and someday make lots of, well, I mean, somehow release energy, and, and the, the, the joke is step something equals profit. Um, the nuclei, of course, don't want to, bounce, don't want to fuse together. The, the nuclei, so we're really looking at the nucleus of atoms. Uh, they're charged, and they, they're going to repel each other if you try and get two of them to stick together. So we're talking, we're going to need a large amount of energy in order that they, they, might, bounce, they, they might collide with each other with enough energy that they'll really stick. And so this brings us basically to the question of you know, what exactly are we looking at? This tells us at the bottom energy or the top temperature, they're sort of equivalent and cross section. This is basically how likely is it that, that if we collide two together, they're going to, to fuse. So this tells us, I mean, of course, higher is better. This tells us that the curve we're interested in of, of the, the possible fusion candidates, the one that is best is labeled here DT, um, which is, means deuterium and tritium. And we're, talk, going, we're looking at temperatures in the range of 100 million degrees. Kelvin, Celsius, it makes no difference, uh, but of order of 100 million. So this already sets quite a lot of difficulties. So this is basically what I've said at the bottom. This gives us our reaction. We're looking with, uh, to fuse deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, with tritium, which is extra heavy hydrogen. Um, we get a peak around, let's say, 100 plus million degrees uh, Celsius, so that's basically our target. And so we're looking at a reaction that takes deuterium and tritium and gives us helium and a neutron and, and, and lots of energy. So that's our goal. That's that. There we go, I've defined the goal. In summary, we get some deuterium and tritium, we heat them up, we make sure they stay put, fusion happens, profit. Brilliant, there's our five-step plan. Um, so a little word, I mean, 100 million degrees is, is very hot, very, very hot. Um, for reference, the core of the sun is about 15 million degrees, and the surface of the sun is only about 5,000 degrees. I claim, and I believe this is really true, that fusion research labs are the hottest places in the entire solar system. Um, and so at temperatures anywhere close to this, we're talking about plasma. So this is the fourth state of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Lots and lots of people know you heat them up and you move from, from everything rigidly together to everything sort of fluidly together, the gas where everything is split up. In a plasma, even the atoms split up. So they're, they're, we're talking about the ions and the electrons really separating away from each other. And so we end up with this sort of soup of ions and electrons. And that is what a plasma is. Where it gets interesting is this point that I've labeled here. So every particle we've got in our plasma is charged. We've got positive ions and we've got negative uh, electrons. And this means that the plasmas interact with electromagnetic fields. I mean, if you put a, 
a charged particle in, in, uh, in front of a magnet or something, then, then, then you can interact with it. And in fact, they also generate their own electromagnetic fields. Plasma may be relatively exotic on Earth. I mean, we see it in lights. I mean, a candle flame is plasma, but almost ever a, a very large fraction of, of stuff in space is, is plasma. Um, and so a lot of the difficulties of fusion physics or a lot of fusion physics is plasma physics. So where we're struggling with in order to do fusion, a lot of this is really just trying to understand plasma physics. So I said that, that plasmas interact with fields. So, hit, so this basically defines the, the concept that I'm, I'm talking about today, which is the idea we're going to try and build basically a magnetic bottle and use magnets to hold a plasma. And that's what's otherwise known as magnetic confinement fusion. This is famous saying that this, um, for, uh, that, that, that was said many years ago. They say we want to put the sun in a box. The idea is problem. The, the idea is pretty. The problem is we don't know how to make the box. Um, so this is basically, I mean, a little bit about what I said before. I mean, imagine we had some some random particle, this little red particle sitting here. I give it a kick, and it will just fly away. I mean, this is you can imagine sort of billiard balls. You give it a nudge, and you don't let, and, and you don't touch it again, and it will fly away. If we have a magnetic field. In this case, it's going into the screen or out of the screen. I mean, without an, uh, a few more labels, it's, it's impossible to say which. And imagine which, you know, the, the blue particle is a charged particle. I give it a little kick in this direction and it changes its mind. It goes around in a circle. And so this is basically, this is the, the concept that we have. So that the dominant motion is that the particles will gyrate, as we call it, around these magnetic fields. And you know, I said in this case, the magnetic field goes into the screen. So imagine we could put, we could build, add, uh, a series of magnetic field lines. The particles would stay relatively trapped to these lines. This is basically the idea. So brilliant idea. Let's build a cylinder. Let's put a strong magnetic field in it, and the particles will just will stick to these to these to these lines. But I say a cylinder. Um, what do we do at the end? That's the end is always the problem, because we can they're not going to leave the, the the edges of the cylinder. But that when we get to the ends, they're just going to disappear. And essentially, there's nothing we can do at the ends that will keep them in, in, in uh, keep them put. So we take our cylinder, we bend it around, and we get a torus, which is a fancy word for a donut. And that is why all fusion reactors look like big donuts. Um, well, that nearly works. The problem is, what I said before works only if we have a cylinder. <laughs> the moment that we bend it, we actually break the property that the, that the particles stick nicely onto these lines. They're close, but they, they move away from it slightly here. I've drawn them drifting upwards. Um, but there's still a trick we can do. We can introduce a twist to the magnetic field. So instead of basically a curved cylinder, we, the, the cylinder itself has to have a twist bef before we, 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 we close it. So we end up with these nested he helixes of, of magnetic fields, and that's how we build our machines. And this basically brings us to the two types of magnetic fusion. We've got one where we build the, the helix extrinsically, shall we say, where we build this very complicated structure of magnetic fields. Uh, and that's a stellarator. And the other one is we stick to our, our donut, we stick to everything just being regular. Uh, we don't build a, the, 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 the 3D helix ourselves. We let, we, we, we push a massive current through our plasma and this current acts like a transformer, creates a magnetic field and this basically induces one. And so the, the, the point is we put an enormous current through our plasma and that's basically what a tokamak is. And so tokamak, as I'll say now, Anyone who knows their Russian will, of course, know that Tokamak is a, an acronym which stands for toroidal chamber with magnetic fields. Um, and here's just a little, uh, this, this is a, a little animation of the, the Tokamak that we have at, at our laboratory and, and, and basically how, how it looks in a sort of exploded view. Uh, this entire thing is uh, something like five-ish meters across. I don't, I don't know exactly, but that's a sort of order of magnitude. So there we go, we've got an enormous, and, th and there we would have our, our pink plasma in, in, inside our, um, inside our token. Uh, so if we explode that view, so now taking basically a slice through it, we've got what used to be a cylinder that we've bent around, we take a slice, we have the plasma in the middle, we've got uh, some lots of magnetic coils, so we've got the D-shape, these, these, these greenish, uh, things. These are the ones that drive our, our, our quote unquote normal current that, I, that we would have had even in, in, in the cylinder picture. And this, this creates our dominant field. Then in the middle, we have a giant solenoid, which is how we generate our, our big current. We're talking, you know, millions of amps as a current. And then all of these coils, which, you know, in the cross section, you can't see, but these are basically giant rings. These are all involved in, in various as, uh, as, aspects of shaping the plasma. 
Uh, we have a vacuum vessel, which I think is this blue curve, if I'm this blue line, which I've, if I'm not mistaken, and, and vacuum pumps because we, we operate these things at, at very strong magnets, uh, uh, sorry, at very strong vacuums. Uh, we have a plasma wall, which are these gray elements around here, which he to have to heat, uh, deal with the very, very high heats of the plasma. So we have a lot of heat loads and a lot of material uh, science going on in there. Uh, we also have to heat the plasma. So for example, we fire in beams of particles through some of these ports on the outside. For example, we fire in radio waves to try and heat the plasma. So we, this is how we get it up to our temperature. And of course, what you don't see, of course, is that all around this, 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 uh, this machine, we've got, we've got uh, diagnostics and, and ways, of try, ways to try and measure the plasma. Because of course, it's so hot, you can't, you can't simply stick a thermometer into it. Um, a word about the progress of fusion. Um, of course, Moore's law is famous, right? And Moore's law is, is, is excellent. And I would say that from 1970 up until about 1997, fusion made Moore's law look bad. Uh, we had a, 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 a faster doubling rate slightly. I mean, it's basically in lockstep, but um, these were the machines from the early, uh, uh, from, the, from the 60s going up to, to jet, for example, uh, shown on this figure uh, in the late 90s. Um, of course, the elephant in the room is that uh, not much has changed since this point in time. Um, and that I'll come to on, on the next few slides. And of course, for computing, Moore's law may be dead, but it certainly went past 1997. And I label up here that we have, a, well, what's, what's labeled here as a break-even point at, at, around the ballpark that we're, we're close to. We have up here even higher, we have the target for ITA, and up here we have the target for a commercial reactor. And so really the difficulty is in, is in these final steps up here. I already mentioned ITER. ITER will show up in, in a couple of slides, but this is, shows us basically uh, we have uh, the, the previous uh, figure, the, the, the y-axis was, was labeled, was this triple product. This is basically our figure of merit. In order for fusion to happen, well, the N is density. So the more plasma you have, the more likely that they are to collide with each other and fuse. T is the temperature of the ions, because as I said earlier, you have to be very hot in order that you stand a chance. And this tau E, this, this energy confinement time, this is sort of, if you were to turn everything off, how long would it stay there? So this is somehow an insulation factor, right? I mean, if you can heat everything up, but then it disappears immediately, then you're also not doing, not doing very well. And this is plotted against, against temperature. And we see basically that our target region is, is more, so it's not only maximizing this, but at a given temperature, we want to maximize this. And so uh, various previous machines were in this sort of ballpark. ITER will be really on, the, on the, the threshold of what we label as ignition, and that's where you can almost turn off the heating and, and you would continue to get, to get fusion running. So a word, let's say, about, about that. Uh, the current fusion world record is from JETS, which is a European machine, a JETS 1997 campaign where the Q plasma, which is how much uh, fusion power was in the plasma compared to how much heating power was going into the plasma, was about 65%. Only two tokamaks that I can think of have ever run with the real deuterium tritium. Jet was one and, and one in America was the other one. Uh, because most of the science we can do, this plasma physics, we can try and understand without using tritium. So nor normal experiments run without, without, with only deuterium, or many, most experiments run with only deuterium because we can use this to learn almost everything we want to, we want to learn. ITER, which I've mentioned already, and I'll, I'll go into detail in a moment. This is the big machine, shall we say? This is the big thing. That has a goal of something at least 10. And, and why have we struggled? Why will ITER do better than previous machines? Well, size matters. Um, so just in linear dimensions, of course, you know, this is not air, this is not volume. This is this is really just in, in, in the radius of the machine. ITER will have a radius of about six meters, jet about three meters, and as six upgrade is about is about half again, so about 1.5 meters. And that's a global machine, JET is a European machine, and as is a German machine. So a word about ITER. Um, ITER is really big science. Um, people use the word big science a lot, but ITER is really a mega project. Uh, the partners are China, the European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the United States. So a large fraction of the world's population and economies are represented. Um, each partner contributes in kind. So uh, it, for example, India will build and, and deliver the cryostat for ITER. And this means that it's impossible to say really how much ITER costs because it's not like people are handing over money and then ITER will build it, but really they develop pieces and deliver the pieces. 
but around about figure of about 20 billion dollars or something you know 15 to 20 billion euros is about the order the, the order we're talking about it's being constructed in the south of france um a lot has happened in the last few years and i would prefer anyone interested to look at the ETA the press for, for videos and, and, and pictures because some of them have been really impressive. Um, the target for the first plasma is the end of 2025, which is getting close. Uh, and ETA will then start approaching full power, I think 10 or 11 years after that. So let's say 11, 2036 is about when really we have the crunch question of can ETA deliver these goals of, of, of large amounts of fusion power. Um, a word eater is not a power plant per se. It's really just a, it's still a, a large scale scientific experiment, and it is a demonstration of fusion at large scale. So we're talking about 500 megawatts of fusion power. And for example, eater, uh, sorry, for example, uh, Europe has a roadmap of eater and then a demo machine, which would basically be a demonstration power plant, and then really commercial power plants after that. Um, some pictures that I've stolen from the ETA web pages down in this corner, we have a, an ETA, stand, ETA standard human. Um, it's enormous. So from, as I said, the radius from the middle of the donut to the center is about six meters. So from the left of the donut to the right of the donut, we're looking at 16 -ish, 16 to 20 meters across. This is basically the cryostat and the magnet coils and the plasma. But of course, this is sitting in a much larger uh, complex. Um, these, this is the, the, the plasma, the tokamak building. This is an animation of what it, or a, a, a render of what it will look like. Uh, of course, we've got cooling systems, we've got heating systems, lots and lots of diagnostics, and so forth. And that is still only the building in the middle. This is an enormous site with a lot of different systems. Uh, from 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 power, it's basically running a, its own sub a substation on site because it's dealing with enormous amounts of, of power uh, going onto the site. So I showed this little graph before about uh, the different parts of a tokamak machine, but now I've shown it again where I label some select aspects of the science. Um, obviously, this is not uh, uh, I'm not covering everything, but this is just a, a little highlight reel. Um, in the core plasma, so we've got really the plasma in the middle. So really in, in, in inside this red line, basically, uh, we've got turbulence, which affects the heat, which affects really micro, microscopic um, scales. We've got MHD or magnetohydrodynamics, which is really the big scale stuff. This is basically like, I mean, imagine running hydrodynamic simulations, but imagine the whole fluid is, is, is a conductor and you've got magnetic fields on top of this. So this really determines the, the macroscopic um, stability. And then I've highlighted in blue because it's my field. Um, the, this is energetic particle physics. Basically, this bridges the scales. It's a mesoscale. This is really in between. Um, and I'll say a word of this in a minute because it's my favorite field. Of course, there's a lot of interest in, in how the heat gets into the plasma and what effect that that has in the core. As we move away from the core of the plasma towards the edge, of course, there's the interaction between plasma and wall. We've got atomic physics starts to become relevant over there. Uh, the whole edge region is a boundary condition for the core region. So this is a very important element. And of course, where would we be without turbulence in the edge as well as the core? Finally, um, diagnostics even, I mean, diagnostics are, are, are twofold. One is building a diagnostic in order to measure something. And the second one is building a diagnostic and understanding what it's telling you, which is often very complicated because we really, most measurements are indirect based on emission or laser. Uh, lasers or, or interferometry or, or, or radio waves, this type of thing. Uh, material science, where we get higher uh, uh, charged particles hitting hitting tile, hitting the wall. This is really a, a, a cutting edge for a lot of the material science research. And then, of course, there's the technology, which is uh, how to build the the magnet systems and so forth, which I skip here, but is is very interesting as well. Um, a little word on 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 some of the challenges of the science. Uh, We've got the electrons uh, gy uh, gyrating around the magnetic field at a, with a frequency of gigahertz, but the plasma is evolving on the order of uh, seconds. We've got the, again, the electron motion is uh, fractions of a millimeter and the machine is multiple meters. So even, maybe we don't care about the electron motion, but even let's say some of the waves we're looking at are, uh, um, in the range of megahertz or close to high, uh, hundreds of kilohertz, 
and we need to know, understand how this interacts with, with processes which are much slower or even much faster. And so this bridging of, of the, the, the spatial temporal length scales is, is really one of the big headaches, I would say, of, of fusion plasma physics. Okay, so my favorite field, energetic particle physics. Okay, so let's suppose, let's, let's, let's simply state for a moment as fact that our, our fusion process is successful. We recall that we had our target fusion reaction. We take some deuterium and some tritium and we get some helium and we get a neutron. The neutron's gone. It leaves the plasma, I mean, neutrons just disappear, uh, heats up the water, makes some steam, drives a turbine, and this is how you would build a power station, essentially. The helium atom, on the other hand, or this alpha particle we have, this still carries a fifth of the energy. Um, and this is, this is basically how ITA or any future, uh, future fu uh, fusion power plant will be self-heated, as we say, because we really have to harness the energy of this, of this helium particle. It stays in the plasma because it's, it's charged, because it's, an, um, uh, because it's an, a nucleus. Um, and if we convert this, this, this temperature, the, the energy of three and a half mega electron volts, which is how much each particle has, and then we take how this interacts with the equilibrium and we say, okay, maybe the average energy is one mega electron volt after, we've got some, after it's interacted. We can say approximately modulo some definitions of temperature that the helium has about a temperature of 10 billion degrees. So this makes what I previously said is the hottest place in the solar system at 100 million degrees sound almost cold. Um, and why they're interesting is even if we have a relatively small number of them, they're moving fast enough that they really can resonate with magnetic, with magnetic waves that we have in the plasma. And this is the interaction that, that we basically want to study. Okay, um, I said this talk was about modeling or simulating plasmas, but of course we had to really, I wanted to cover a, a lot about what fusion is before getting there. And so a little word now about some, some of the, the methods for, for going into how to do modeling. Um, so in the core of the plasma, we've got a few, let's say, workhorse models. We've got MHD. This is basically fluid dynamics, but where the, the, the fluid is conducting. So if we think, okay, often compressionless, but let's say we take the Navier-Stokes equation, we add in a long scale, uh, we add, add in magnetic fields. This is um, fun, right? Even if it's only, quote unquote, only fluid models. And the, this is the, the, these are the equations, or this is the type of physics which governs, for example, primarily the equilibrium, but also the macro scale stuff, so the, the current and the pressure and how the instabilities that they create. Then we have really a kinetic approach where we say, okay, let's take a model where we not only take into account the, the density and the current and the pressure, which are statistical quantities, but we try and really take into account the, the, um, the directions as well. So this is we, we end up with basically a, a problem which now has six, six dimensions in it. I say six dimensions, we can cheat a little bit. Um, this little cartoon I showed earlier, well, if we've got a particle that's very quickly moving around a magnetic field, is it really so different from a disk that's moving slowly? Not really. And so we, um, what we can do is we can reduce our problem to only five dimensions and we, move, we remove also the study of this very fast motion. Now this is still heavy, of course, this is five-dimensional five kinetics uh, simulations, this is gyrokinetics, and this is basically the, the, the workhorse for a lot of turbulence calculations. And I want to say it explicitly here because when I show this cartoon, it looks like we have a magnetic field and we have a particle, but actually, of course, as the particle moves, it changes the magnetic field. And so everything is really coupled together with electrodynamics and, and Maxwell's equations. And this is why that uh, when we're looking at, at, at following ions and following electrons in, in a simulation, this is, we, we always have to solve the fields and this is what couples the problem and, and makes it tricky. Um, I spoke a bit a moment ago about various different problems in, in, in that we want to study. Um, and a word here about, let's say we want to study two different problems or the interaction between two different topics. Um, one philosophically can think about, I've labeled it here as top down versus bottom up, maybe depth first versus breadth first. I mean, um, the point is that we can either try and find the superset model, the model that includes everything. So trying to study, you know, no one would ever try and study the universe by taking one atom at a time. But in principle, of course, this, if you take really the, the, the models that govern the very smallest uh, particles, they could explain the universe. 
you just normally wouldn't want to. Um, so we could try and find a model that includes everything, or at least includes both of these things. Or we could try and find a model for problem A and a model for, for problem, problem Y and glue them together somehow. Um, I argue that what it's, it's very important or very useful to have, to have a hierarchy. We want to be able to do both. Um, we want to be able to run the expensive model with, which contains as a, as a, uh, both parts as its subset to validate any uh, models that we do where, which are basically gluing or coupling others together. And then, of course, once we, if we know that, that, that this approach works, then we can do an exploration with the simpler and cheaper one. So, for example, I mean, as an example, energetic particle physics, we're looking at large scale uh, instabilities, high frequencies, and discrete and coherent uh, instabilities. And turbulence has small scale uh, structures, it has lower frequencies, and um, this, it often has broad spectra. And what I'll say in a moment, but what, 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 what we start to see is we're using now the, the models that really were dis originally developed for these microscopic uh, 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 modeling. And we're now applying them also to studying the, the larger scale and on the same footing. A word about coupling, of course, we, if we want to build workflows with, let's say, heating and equilibrium and transport, these will never be able to do uh, from the top down approach. And a lot of effort has gone into standardization of uh, conventions and data formats. And um, when Simon Pinches gave a, 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 uh, an easy build site presentation at the meeting last year, he spoke a bit about the, the data standardization effort that, that they've been leading. So finally, I'd like to say a word or two about what I actually do. Um, we co-develop uh, a particle in Shell, um, five-dimensional gyrokinetic code, which originally was used for turbulence, but now we use it extensively for, for energetic particle physics. So this in principle offers us the possibility to look at both energetic particle physics and turbulence. And also we're starting to use it to look at really the larger scale MHD type instabilities. So my particular focus is using it to um, simulate and predict how the alpha particles might drive instabilities for ETA. A little word about, about, how the, about the code itself. It's a particle in cell code, which is a Lagrangian approach for, for those interested. Uh, and basically we, we do Monte Carlo sampling of, of particles in the system. And so we follow from some millions up to many billions of particles in a 3D field. We solve the fields using the particles, which we do with finite elements. And of course, this is basic, this is the loop. This is what we repeat. On the right-hand side, I've, I've shown a figure, which is on, on the website, uh, made by some colleagues with some turbulence using this code. And on this slide, this is, these are the, this is the scale of, of the, uh, this is one of my simulations, the same, uh, this was ETA, this is also ETA. And we see that we have these much larger scale structures that we need to treat coherently, even though we're doing it from a, essentially a microscopic or, or a micro scale uh, simulation approach. Um, a second remark, we're also working with, with for example, a pair of codes. Uh, written well, one by um, one by my boss and, and one by Simon, who gave the, the ETA talk last year. Um, one will tell you, will solve an eigenvalue problem. It will tell you what the mode would look like. It will tell you what frequency it will have. And the other one says, okay, if you give me a mode, then I can evolve it. Now, of course, we know we're throwing things away because this is a this this is taking them separately is is not uh, doesn't doesn't include every possible um, interaction. And this is why validation is important. This, of course, is taking a combination of codes like this is, of course, much cheaper and much more robust than the work that I showed on the previous slide. Um, and if validated, of course, is a much better approach for, for checking parameter space or, do, or studying uh, possibilities. I talk here about two codes coupled together, but these codes are also being coupled into much more complicated workflows, which take into, into account many, many things. And, and this is great because these, the, these codes are really robust to the point that, that um, they don't need so much interve intervention when setting up uh, simulations and, and such forth. So that's basically my talk. I'd like to put an outlook or an outlook or a word about the future, shall we say, um, specifically, I mean, in general about fusion. ITER is coming. The fusion world is watching and preparing. Um, ITER is probably the final fusion science experiment and the machines which come after ITER will be really demonstrations of technology. 
Um, I claim that modeling and simulation is very important and some general trends we have big. So this is sort of the top-down approach that I mentioned. We have connected, which is sort of this, this, this coupling, this bottom um, up approach. And we have ensemble, which I didn't talk about today, but this is where people are really trying to do valid, uh, improve validation, verification, and, and uncertainty quantification by running lots and lots of simulations to get a better idea of the errors in, 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 the, in the results. Obviously, my work is very, very important, which of course everybody says, but um, specifically why I say that is I'm interested in really the alpha particles. And so the, the fact that ITER is going to be the first machine with a significant amount of self-heating is means that it's, ITER in a certain sense will be qualitatively different uh, with respect to the uh, these high energy ions compared to any previous machine. Everyone, of course, will say that their work is the most important, but you know, um, that's that's why I'm in this. Is, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Anyway, thank you very much for for listening, um, and I hope you didn't mind hearing something a little bit different. Thank you, Thomas. Um... Kenneth at least has some questions, so we'll start with his. But if anybody else has some questions, then please do raise your hand in Zoom and we'll allow you to ask Thomas. <clears throat> uh, the first question I had is, that you mentioned that the, the ITER partners are contributing in kind, so they're building stuff and shipping it to the south of France. That, that's a huge logistics nightmare, right? Because we're, we're not talking about nuts and bolts, but we're talking about huge magnets and hugely accurate stuff that's probably very sensitive to shipping it. Um, um, how, yeah. how, much, how much of a nightmare is this? And, and is this the best approach compared to just building everything on site, essentially? So not so f first thing to say is not everything is being shipped. Um, so the very largest components were produced on site, but still by one of the partners. So the take, for example, mm, they don't really, okay, these pink coils. I, I mean, we're seeing the end of them, but these go really around the outside of the machines. Machine. So these enormous disks, they have built a lot, one of the largest machines on the ITER site. In fact, since I have a picture, um, it's one of these two, I forget which, um, is to build those on site. So this is where they wind those, I mean, they're, they're superconductors. They wind those superconductors uh, to make them on site. Uh, I think the cryostat was also assembled on site. Uh, and actually the small list of the, the top one and the bottom one, these were small enough to ship. In terms of logistics, yes, it's a nightmare. They built a special road, they built an extra port. They have this robotic spider platform that they can put things on and ship at one or two kilometers an hour and things to take to approach from the port all the way up to the site. But um, at least there's a, a, a sea access to not that far away. Uh, the central piece is coming from the US and there was a, a video recently of, of, of basically how the US shipped it and how it uh, was arriving at the other end. Um, the fact that it's an international project it, in the way that it is does of course make things more complicated. It would have been easier for one organization to do everything. But of course, the idea is the technology sharing. I mean, when you're when you're looking at a at a mega project with so many partners involved, everyone wants to understand the technology, and everything is very is is pretty open in terms of the designs for things. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. I see. Orca has a question as well, so let him go first. Yeah. Uh, once you get proper self heating going, how do you shut it down in a controlled fashion without leaking plasma all over the place? Um, so there's two parts of your question, I think. One of them is in general, how do you shut down a plasma? And the other one is somehow, I guess, related to how do you avoid a, a, a leak? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, a leak is well, perhaps not the problem. That, because, no, 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 um, it's not quite but how do you stop um, uh, a runaway uh, reaction or something like this? Yeah. Um, so the good news is that fusion is really hard. <laughs> Which yeah. means that you only have to cool, you only have to cool your plasma down a tiny little bit, or or if it comes into contact with the wall or something, then of course it's the amount of of, of energy stored in the plasma is still much much small. It's still a, a small amount, and when we don't have a very much a large amount of fuel in the plasma at any one time, hmm. uh, a few grams I think off the top of my head. Okay. Um, 
So keeping it going is the hard part. So if you turn off the, the, the gas injector, then the, then the reactor, then the, then the fusion reaction will stop. The second part is a serious point, and that is how do you end the plasma discharge? Uh, for example, you know, for the experiments we have here, they run for five seconds or something, and then they stop. And this is a big concern because the danger, of course, and this, this happens, the danger is that uh, if the plasma is, has an uncontrolled end, you end up with this millions of amps of current uh, well, either lifting the machine up and the whole thing jumps up and down, and this has happened to, to these many hundred of ton, ton, ton machines, or another problem is that they can accelerate electrons and this, then you have a beam. And so there are, there's a lot of work going into de um, developing schemes, uh, for example, for uh, by shooting in a large, essentially with, with what looks like a shotgun, you're firing a, a, a giant lump of, of, of hydrogen ice, um, and this cools it down relatively quickly. Oh, yeah. This is this it should work on ITER on a lot on current machines. We tend to just puff in a lot of gas, um, but but for the size of ITER, they decided that this might not be the best approach. All right, good enough. <laughs> you had an answer. <laughs> and another question I have, I think something very different and maybe a, a more general thing, so not specific to fusion is what, what, what is the biggest challenge for you as a researcher currently to, to do your research? Is it things like not having enough compute resources or is it having to program GPUs or... So what, what, what's, your, what's your biggest problem that, yeah, that you lose a lot of time on? I lose a lot of time doing a lot of things, but <laughs> um, let's just take, for example, our, 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 this project, right? Um, I was thinking about this before, there were something like four types of problems. There's a problem which is, okay, uh, something is very expensive or will take a long time to simulate, or we don't have the resources to run it. And these are the good problems, right? We, we know in principle what we need to do. Maybe we have to work on optimizing the code. Maybe we need to work on, on improving the algorithm. Then there were problems where at the level of the equations, we have something which is it either isn't what we want or doesn't really so, uh, address exactly the problem we want, or the form of the equations doesn't have the, the, the nice numerical properties. Because what I didn't mention is that when you go from your, uh, when you go from, 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 basically when you go from kinetics down to, to, to gyrokinetics, the equations become messy. Add into that, we do everything in, for, 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 for computational reasons, we do everything in, in a very complicated coordinate system, and the geometry becomes even messier. So in a certain sense, 60 Vlasov, okay, a lot of people are doing this relativistically for laser or for space stuff is incredibly expensive, but at least the equations are quite simple by comparison. Um, then there are problems really with uh, conceptual, so that some things just need coding, right? I mean, sometimes it really is a matter of, okay, at some point we just need to write some code, but logically this is easy. It just goes onto a list of things to get to get coded up. And sometimes it's a matter of interpretation. So you, you get something and then I might run a simulation, I might uh, an analyze the results. This might not be entirely clear and this might require then developing new diagnostics for the code or for post-processing or, or during the simulation. And so it's a little bit of all of these things together, I would say. Um, the code does run on GPUs. Um, I, we often, we still largely run it on CPU machines, partly because uh, of the machines we have. We're running on many different computers, but some with and some without. Um, GPU performance and CPU performance. Um, there were probably some algorithms where you would say, okay, problem, X, it, uh, problem is, is X times faster on, on GPU compared to CPU, but many complex codes, you have many different parts of the codes, some parts work better on others, and depending on exactly what your input file looks like, it might be a perfect case for running on a GPU, or it might be that you know the bottleneck is the bit that the GPU doesn't help you with. Unfortunately for me, my parameters are in the end where the GPUs are not helping that much. Um, of course, there's a lot of really fundamental work being done with, with, with studying smaller systems, but including more physics. And for those, we, we tend to find the GPUs are much more helpful. Um, de debugging GPUs is a pain. Developing for GPUs is not always such a pain. It's a Fortran code. Let's say, I don't know, the code is something 50,000 lines, 40,000 lines, 100,000, or something like that. 
Um, the first version of the port to GPUs, which was done by some people in Switzerland, it's a collaboration with Switzerland uh, and, and Warwick and, and IPP. The first version of the GPU port, I think had 500 open ACC directives only. This is now increased. We're now looking at probably a thousand ish. Um, and it's not a perfect port, of course, but this is, gives you an idea that the vast majority of the code really is uh, not, I mean, we're not writing low level code or code or anything like that. Mm. And uh, so do you expect that to change the, the challenges that you're having with, with getting your stuff running and efficiently? Because the from from what we see, things are changing quite a bit. There's like this cloud is everywhere, cloud bursting, ARM is coming, risk five is on the horizon. So that's probably not gonna make the work of researchers easier in terms of getting things to work and work efficiently. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know a lot of codes now have very deep software stacks or dependency stacks. And I'm very glad that we don't. Uh, we depend on MPI, a Fortran compiler, uh, FFTW, HDF5, and some implementation of LAPAC and BLAS. And this is compared to the code I was working on before, which is not so numerically demanding, but which depended, for example, on the NAG library. I'm never going to be able to develop and debug that on my lap because I would not have access to the NAG library. Um, I'm running a Windows laptop. I have WSL running. I compile and test toys, I mean, really tiny problems, but I can run on my, on my laptop. Um, of course, not these simulations. Of course not. That's not the point. But there's a lot that can be gained by, um, by keeping a, a, a flexible stack. Um, so I'm not scared by ARM. I'm not really scared by RISC-V, other than I don't think there's a Fortran compiler. Um, and uh, if we talk for a moment about this standardization effort, um, which we don't include really into our, the code, our code at a stack level, but only as a pre-processing and post-processing level, um, this, for example, would be bring in a lot of dependencies that we really don't want to have at runtime. We don't necessarily know where we're going to be running and what the access policies are and all this kind of stuff. And so the easier we have that it is for us to port um, the code to a new platform, the better in, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's a very good answer. Yeah, and and being, being aware of that, I think is a first big step towards being able to keep up and, and keep running on, on big machines, uh, which you clearly need. You know. Does anyone have any other questions? I have one more, maybe not your question. Um, if there's no others, I can ask. It. Uh, so the the ITER project, it's clear that this is sort of going to be a catalyst if it's successful. Um, like the first thing that really shows that this can work and that, that paves the road, let's say, for commercial reactors. How sure is it that ITER can make its goals? Is it like 99.999% and we just have to really show it? Or are there still open questions? Or do people expect surprises to come up that may basically make this whole thing fail and put us back 20 years in terms of progress? I would say that ETA still has a lot of, there are a lot of unanswered questions to what will happen with ETA, but I think they come down into the specifics. Um, I would, I, I think that, the Q equals 10 goal, for example, this is not, this is a relatively conservative goal. Um, and I think this is most likely to be achieved. It has other goals, for example, in the later phase, they want to test operation with lower Q, but where they can run the machine for much longer at a time. What I didn't mention earlier when I talked about Stellarators and Tokamaks is a Stellarator in principle can run forever. A Tokamak you have to run in a pulsed way and ITER plans, I think, to run, I think a thousand seconds at a time, I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, and the goal is how do we basically lengthen these pulses up to, up to multiple hours. And this is one of the things that ITER wants to do later. Um, in principle, you can really conceive of, uh, and it all comes down to the central solenoid. That's how we drive the current and you can't keep, you need to, 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 to um, you basically run out of flux at some point and you can't create any more um, a current. Uh, there are ideas of how to minimize this. So essentially the plasma is generating all of the current that it needs. And the, but this is much more the, the later part of ETA. 
Um, but the stated number one goal, perhaps, depends where you read the goals, but I think the number one goal is usually the Q equals 10. I think it will be achieved. Um, some could say that, I mean, so, so let's go back. I, mean, I said earlier that, e, that the European roadmap is ITER delivers, we build a demonstration machine, and then power plants can come after that. Um, other countries might not wait for ITER to deliver before they start building uh, their next machines. Um, and this depends really on how much risk you're willing to take and how urgent you think it is. And, and I mean, there are many other in, uh, ingredients, but there are also some technologies that ITER should really test for the first time. Um, which I didn't go into, but I really that would be needed for a power plant that have never been considered up until now or can't be tested on, on current machines. So for example, we don't, the idea is that I mean, we need tritium for the, for, the, for the fusion, but you can't dig tritium out of a mine anywhere. You need to be self-sustaining in generating your own tritium. So we would take lithium and we would generate the tritium. And when I, when I said that the neutron heats up some water and makes steam, well, the plan is it would turn some lithium into some tritium and create some steam. So this is something that is theoretically understood and there were goal and there were designs, um, but has never been demonstrated. And ITER would demonstrate that and test out some different designs, for example, uh, on a relatively small scale, but for the first time in, in, in really uh, actually testing. Yeah, so we'll, we'll learn more, I guess, in the next yeah, 10 years. Yeah. Uh, whether that's actually successful. Okay, I see other questions. So, Icon and York as well. I don't hear you. Uh, this is strange. Yeah, now it's better. better. Oh, it's better? Yep. Okay. So I, I saw that you comment that uh, your code is 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 it's right in, in Fortran, and you comment that your you have a lot of problems about debugging code. Do you think that uh, Fortran in the development or in for uh, applications that run on GPU using Fortran is not slowing down your work because uh, there is a there there is several issues on on debuggers in Fortran in GPU. You don't have uh, the full capabilities that you have on GPU, and also I I don't know if you are using the infrastructure on BSC. And also the fact that your GPUs are in a, in a Power 9 uh, architecture. Do you think that's slowing down your work? Um, not necessarily. I mean, so we're not only running on Power 9, we're also running on GPUs with x86. Um, uh, the, of course, as I mentioned that the, the code is uh, was ported to, to GPUs by the Swiss, and of course they're running at CSCS on, on PISDAIN. That was why they did this work primarily. Um, but in terms of Fortran and GPU develop, uh, debugging, the problem tends not to be specifically uh, one of Fortran. It tends to be more about if somebody's modifying a, a separate part of the code or introducing new variables, then we always have to ask the question of, does anything need to be moved in terms of data, for example, onto the GPU? Now, the best tool we have in this, in this is we do our CI testing also runs on GPUs. Um, so in general, for example, we generally say that not everybody needs to know how to uh, develop for GPUs, but everyone should probably be aware of the implications of the fact that the code needs to run on GPUs, if that makes some sense. We have time for one more, York. Cool. First, thanks a lot for a very interesting talk. So being a scientist myself, that is always something I'm interested in. The question I'm having is, as we were talking about CPUs versus GPUs, what is better and so on. If I'm looking at your problem, you basically have one particle and that is surrounded by 
many, many more particles. And I was wondering if we are benefit from switching from the traditional ways of computing problems into something like, for example, IPU, where you've got basically plenty of small processing units and they have their own, in, own individual memory. Maybe that is helping. What I don't know, obviously, is if Fortran, for example, is ported to it. I know that IPUs are used quite a lot for um, artificial intelligence, intelligence and machine learning and all of that. But maybe that might be something to, to look into. So the short answer is I don't know. The longer answer is um, what is important to make clear, unlike, for example, molecular dynamics, we're not looking at the direct interaction of one particle and another particle. We evolve the particles, all of them independently, and then all of the particles dis uh, um, put their charge or their current or something onto the, the global grid. And then we're really solving the fields like this. Um, and, and the nature of how plasmas um, interact is, for example, the, the collisions also are not binary collisions. So I think a lot that might be won in some more classical many particle models may or may not also transport. Um, but it's an interesting idea now, I and mean, we can look into it. The question, of course, is, is the hardware and how well is it supported? And the fact that we can run our code on CPUs and GPUs uh, is uh, for us um, already uh, enough types of hardware for the time being. Thank you, Thomas, for the talk. Um, we'll say uh, we'll wrap up there so that we have a little bit of a break before the next one. Um, very interesting to hear about the science, um, you know, work actually doing using this software we installed.